Hey everyone, I pray you are doing well and that you are finding comfort in your God who works all things according to the counsel of his will, even viruses and stay-at-home orders. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 1, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I'm helped to know that the Apostle and the church throughout the ages experience the difficulty of being hindered from fellowship. And though our hindrance is something novel, we are by no means the first to experience such a challenge. Before we get into our message this morning, I want to pray. I want to ask the Lord's blessing on me, the preacher, and on you, the hearer of God's word. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are good. And I thank you for these brothers and sisters, these friends who have uh, humbled themselves to sit now under your word and, and to hear a preacher preach. Father, I pray that as you have ordained preachers to declare your, um, your truth throughout the ages, I pray, Father, that you would anoint me by the power of your spirit to do what it is you've called me to do. I pray that I might supernaturally be submissive and humble to your word, declaring your greatness and helped not to sin. Father, I pray that uh, in any way that I might be a distraction, Lord, I pray that you would uh, hinder me from being a distraction. I pray that you'd hinder me from speaking anything that is less than your truth. Father, I pray that you'd supernaturally enable me to be helpful. And I pray, Lord, for these dear friends and dear ones of mine as they hear your word, Lord, I pray that you might shape them, you might bless them. And I pray that we might all rejoice because we are the people chosen of God and given your good word. Father, what a treat it is to know you. I pray that you might reveal more of yourself in this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today, we will be looking at Psalm 51, and I'm going to limit myself to the first six verses, uh, giving our attention to those first six verses of Psalm 51. Let's go there together now and read our passage. Psalm 51, to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth, in the inward being, in the secret heart you have taught me wisdom. Last week... I mentioned that the book of Psalms contains 150 songs in the songbook of the people of God in their gathered worship. This hymn book has a wide variety of song styles employed to bring the gathered worshipers to God from the various emotional states that we can find ourselves in. I think it's helpful even from the outset to understand that the Scriptures understands us who would come to the Scriptures to be emotionally people emotional people who go on roller coasters. We can go to the highest heights and the lowest lows, and the book of Psalms is for people like us. We took note last week that Psalm 126 is a song of ascents, a song set apart for the journey up to Jerusalem for religious festivals like Passover. It is a song expressing the longing to be brought through a particularly difficult and painful season that seems to be brought on by external circumstances in the culture and society in which the people of God are living. Psalm 51 expresses a similar longing to be rescued from intense pain, but the pain is clearly an internal ache within the heart, within the soul, within the mind of the author. While Psalm 126 was designed for a journey from home to the temple, Psalm 51 is written for the saint's journey from guilt to grace. If you look there at the beginning of Psalm 51, uh, if your Bible's like mine, you'll notice that it has a title. 
Uh, In my copy of the scriptures, Psalm 51 has been titled, Create in me a clean heart, O God. We believe that the scriptures, the book of Psalms, is inspired by God, and they are without error. This title, or these words that we are reading on the page, is not scripture, and so it's not without error. We see it as a simple, helpful tool to find our way through the book, to find what we're looking for, just like the verse numbers and chapter numbers elsewhere help us through our passages to find what we're looking for, though they are not inspired in errant, God-breathed out words. The next thing we see is that this psalm, this 51st psalm, is addressed to the choir master. Some versions will say to the director of music or something along those lines. Though these words are found before the song begins in verse 1, it is part of the inerrant scripture as something of a prologue or an introduction. The title is not from the author, from the spirit, or from King David, but this address to the choir master is. This address to the choir master is a simple yet powerful reminder to us that the people of God and the praises designed for God are a group thing. Many struggle with gathering with the church to sing God's praise. But this address to the choir master, to a leader of a group of singers, reminds us that whether it is difficult or not, we are called to join with other singers. We are not simply called, God doesn't call soloists, he calls choir members to sing his praises. We may not be particularly fond of the musical notes that our church may sing. We may not be fond of the instruments that are used to lead worship. We will struggle sometimes to be in the same room with fellow singers, but God has called Christians to be a gathered group of praisers to the choir master. The next thing we see about this psalm even before we get to verse 1, is that its author is noted. We don't know the author of Psalm 126, but of Psalm 51, we do know. Some of the psalms are anonymous, like Psalm 1, the last one we looked at last week, Psalm 126, but many are attributed to one author or another. 73, 73 of the psalms in the book of Psalms are credited to David within this book. Acts 4.25 tells us that Psalm 2 can be added to that list, and Hebrews 4.7 gives credit to David for Psalm 95, thus making David the author of 75, or a full 50% of Israel's songbook. Did you know that David wrote 50% of the Psalms? We then read that this psalm comes from a time when Nathan the prophet went to David, after he had gone into Bathsheba. This sentence gives us a bit of the historical setting in which this song is written. David comes into the biblical story in 1 Samuel 16. He's a simple shepherd boy at that point, but he is a skilled musician who's tasked with comforting soul-sick King Saul with his music. David would go as a young man into King Saul's tent when he was tormented and depressed and uh, soul sick, and he would play music for him to comfort him and to help him. David is the one to kill Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. Kids, you remember the story of David and Goliath? This person in this writing this song for us is the same man who killed the giant Goliath. David would go on then. Uh, to serve King Saul throughout the book of 1 Samuel. David becomes king himself in 2 Samuel, and he is Israel's best and most godly king. In 2 Samuel, we read God made a gracious covenant with David, a covenant in which God would appoint a future son of David to rule as king forever. And the son of David we know as Jesus Christ, God keeping his promise to David and pointing us to Jesus, the son of David, the king of kings who will rule forever. There are many excellent proofs that David loved and trusted God. Elsewhere we read that God's testimony of David is that he's a man after God's own heart. But 2 Samuel 11 proves that David was far from perfect, that he was a man with deeply sinful desires. 
We see in 2 Samuel 11 that David took some personal time for rest and relaxation while his forces went off to war. He then found himself playing the peeping Tom. We read in 2 Samuel 11 that he saw a beautiful woman by the name of Bathsheba that not only didn't belong to him, but she was the wife of one of the captains of his army. He selfishly took her and taking her in such a way that she became pregnant. David's adultery wasn't going to stay hidden, and so he orchestrated Bathsheba's husband's death. David wasn't only a philanderer, He was a man who orchestrated the death of other innocent men. David's sin, as we see, led to more sin. But he hopes he has hidden his guilt and escaped judgment. 2 Samuel 12 reminds us that though we may be able to hide our sin from other people, God is not deceived. We read in 2 Samuel 12, 1, And the Lord sent Nathan to David. As one of the most overlooked acts of courageous faith, Nathan the prophet confronts King David about his adultery and his murder. You think about Nathan, you think about what a what a what a marvelous act of faith it was, what a marvelous act of obedience of Nathan to obey God, to go before the king, to go before his sovereign. Lord, in a human manner of speaking, and to tell him that he's a sinner, to tell him that he's transgressed God's law. Nathan was given a large task, but God empowered him to obey. Can you imagine how frightening that must have been to to put that to-do list, put that action on your to-do list, I need to go to the king and confront him about his sin and his murder? What a scary thing that must have been. David hears Nathan's rebuke, and David humbly admits, I have sinned against the Lord. Though David has committed a truly heinous sin, his humble response of confession and repentance reveal that he is still a man who loves and trusts God. Psalm 51 is a faith-filled song written by and for those who love God, yet stumble in many ways in the fight against sinful desires. Maybe the most important question for every sinner, whether you are a Christian or not, is what am I to do with my sin? Or what can I do about my guilt? This may not be the most pressing question on your mind. You might be thinking about a whole host of things, but I assure you what you are thinking about is not more important than this question about what you're going to do with your sin. And I would argue that the Bible communicates this question as the most important question for every one of us. Psalm 51 has been labeled a penitential psalm, along with Psalm 6, 25, 32, 38, 130, and 143. These penitential psalms show us how to approach God as people who want to walk by the Spirit but sinfully give in to the desires of the flesh. Every Christian knows the frustrating situation of sinning against God and feeling stuck because you don't know how to make things right. Psalm 51 and the other penitential psalms show us a way from the messes we make back into fellowship with God. These songs are a clear answer from God of what we are to do with our sin and our guilt. Let's look now at verse 1 of Psalm 51, and as we get into this uh, exposition of the actual six ver- first six verses, I want to highlight this idea or this theme. Psalm 51, the main idea is that God gives sinners a song for coming back to Him. Just as God gave Israel songs for singing on the way up to the temple, God has given sinners a song for coming back to Him. I basically want to make one point this morning. I want to draw out one point from our passage. Is this. David acknowledges the true chasm between himself and God. David acknowledges the true chasm between himself and God. And so in that song that God gives to sinners for for coming back to him, 
is the acknowledgement of the true chasm between ourselves and God. This one point is broken up into two points, and so we will break that down by highlighting from verses 1 through 6 the truth about David, the truth about the sinner who sings. David begins verse 1 with the request for mercy and ends that verse asking that his transgressions of God's righteous law be blotted out. Nathan helped him see that he had transgressed God's law. And in seeing his guilt, he gives up any fight to deny it or any attempt to justify his actions. Like a man pinned to the ground, he cries out, Mercy! Have mercy on me! It's not hard for me to imagine this cry because I have children who have uh, gotten into wrestling lately, and so we hear this cry, Mercy! Mercy! Get off of me! I can't breathe. David's offending of God wreaks havoc on his conscience, as we see in verse 3 where he says, My sin is ever before me. I can't shake it. I can't shake the reality of what I've done, David is saying. He can't shake his guilt. And he knows, as he says in verse 4, that his sin is not simply getting a B grade or a C grade, but that his sin, his choices, his action is evil against God. He's not confessing that he's slipped up a little bit or that he made an oopsie. He's confessing that he has done evil against God. Verse 4 gives us one of the trickier lines to understand. When David writes of God against you and you only, have I sinned? This little clause, this phrase, you only, I think we, we should understand it properly, not by seeing it as David saying that his sin hasn't hurt or offended anyone but God. I don't think David is so foolish that he would think that the death and the carnage and the lack of ability to trust in their king is to be ignored. No, I think understanding this phrase requires us to slow down and think about it. In these words, David is truly admitting that God is offended first and foremost, not only by his sin, but by every sin. First and foremost, sin is an evil against God. David is, not argue, David is not ignoring all of the social pain and chaos his sin has caused. But he is recognizing that what he has done is wrong, first and foremost, because it is rebellion against God, and not primarily because it hurt someone else. You and I have a habit, and we live amongst the people who have a habit, of defining right and wrong, not according to the character and commands of God, but according to the effect our choices have on others. Many people live by the governing principle that any choice, no matter what it is, is permissible as long as no one gets hurt. The only out-of-bounds territory is if somebody else gets hurt. But when David sings, against you only have I sinned, he is recognizing that his choices have offended God. His choices have made him guilty long before any consideration of the effects his choices have had on other people. Can you take that in? Satan chose to steal another man's wife and the damage that that did to her. He then couldn't bear the idea that his sin would be noticed because this woman had become pregnant by him. And because her husband wouldn't come and take responsibility for his sin, he chose to have that man killed. This is not a cute little oopsie. David's choices that lead to this psalm are are choices full of havoc. Who close to David could trust him? Who in his army that knew what was going on could feel safe? Which of the women around him could feel safe knowing that this was the kind of man that was there? Certainly, certainly there is immense chaos that David's sin have caused. But what David is saying here in verse 4, that even before that incredible mess, first and foremost, My choices, my sins 
are against God. Verse 2 shows us that the ceremonial laws given to Moses gave unclean sinners an opportunity to be washed and cleansed of, of their impurity. As David cries out to be washed and to be cleansed, he sees in the ceremonies that God has created a way. God has written invitations for him to take his heavy and dirty soul to God so that he might be cleansed. In David's trial and in his trouble, in his guilt and in his sin, he knows that he can come to God for cleansing because God has written it in his law. In verse 5, David speaks of his mother and his conception. He's not speaking of any immorality on his mother's part, nor is he blaming his sin on his parents. He is simply admitting that he has been a sinner bent on rebelling against God from his own earliest beginning. Even before he could walk, even before he could choose, David knew that in his innermost part he was a sinner. David isn't claiming to be a good guy who goofed up. He's confessing and leading us to confess that even from our conception, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Now, as we seek to live according to God's word and become those who worship him evermore in spirit and truth, let's apply these truths to our own thinking. We saw in these first six verses that David cries out for mercy. And I wonder, have you, like David, come to the place where you cry out to God for mercy like a person pinned to the ground? Maybe you have to go back to a bully in grade school to think about what that was like to be pinned, to be stuck, to be unable to move. But have you come to a place where in your sin and in your guilt, You feel pinned to the ground and all you can do is cry out for mercy. Listen, you won't cry out for mercy until you see and believe that you can never dig yourself out of the hole that your sin has dug. You won't cry out for mercy until you see that your most sacrificial acts of love and worship will never be enough to fix what you've broken with your sin. You won't cry out for mercy until you see that you can't beat yourself up enough to make up for what you've done. Neither self-hatred nor radical love for neighbor is enough to blot out your transgressions. Do you know that? Do you believe that? If you don't cry out for mercy, you will not receive mercy. And if you don't see that your good deeds, your attempts to earn your way back into God's presence or your attempts to punish yourself to make up for the sin that you've committed it's not enough do you believe that you've got to come to that place where you cannot do anything but cry out for mercy there's nothing you can do but cry out for mercy have you like the psalm teaches come to see your sin as evil because it is first and foremost rebellion against our good and generous god Your harshness with your spouse or your children, your impatience with your neighbor, your lust for someone or something that isn't yours is evil. E-V-I-L, evil. These things are wickedness against God, even if no one else ever knows about it. You don't have to lead a nation to exterminate Jews or fly airplanes into the World Trade Center. You don't have to do these things or something like them to have evil on your record. All you have to do is covet. All you have to do is hate. Everyone who sins walks according to the devil and does the work of which the wages are death. The scriptures are clear. The wages of sin is evil and they are death. Have you come to this place where you see your sin for the wickedness and the evil that it is? Have you, as Psalm 51 leads us, come to see that sin makes you dirty and unclean? Like muddy boots or infected patients, these things are rejected from coming in. And so too, you and I, in our sin, are rejected from fellowship with God. 
My dear wife loves our children deeply, and she has no trouble raising her voice to forbid the kids from coming into the house when they've been playing in the mud. She loves me and has made it clear that showers must be taken to remove sweat and drywall dust before I climb into clean bedsheets. Do you see your sin as making you dirty and so utterly dirty that you are rejected from the holy and pure presence of God? Your sin doesn't simply lower your moral GPA. Your sin makes you filthy. As David recognizes himself as a sinner from, be- from birth and refuses to blame his parents or anyone else for his actions, have you come to see the same truth? Have you come to realize that before the eyes of God, you aren't a pretty good person, but someone who was born in iniquity and conceived in sin? Or do you spend your energies blaming other people or situations? Do you see yourself as a sinner or do you see yourself as a good person caught up in a bad crowd and in bad situations? The truth is, is that we are all sinners who who will sin without any help from others. And blaming someone else is not the path to getting right with God. Brothers and sisters, I have to confess to you that it is incredibly difficult to confess my sin to my children and to ask for their forgiveness. Do you know why? Because I like to blame them. I like to blame them for their lack of obedience. I like to blame them for their craziness. I like to blame them for the messes they make, for why I lost my patience. Psalm 51 is a clear reminder that if we are going to take the road back to God as sinners, We must not be those who blame other people for our actions. The path back to God is one of acknowledging the truth about our sin and the truth about God. We've looked at David and his recognition of the truth about himself, and now I want to look at the truth about God that we see from Psalm 51. As verse 5 moves into verse 6, David recognizes a contrast. You can, can you see that contrast in verse 5 and 6? He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. And then in verse 6, he says, Behold, you delight in truth. And he's drawing a contrast between himself and God. As David has recognized his tendency toward sin and iniquity, David now highlights that God's pleasures and God's working is toward truth and wisdom. David is bent away from the truth and away from wisdom and into foolishness and into sin. He's naturally drifting that way, but he's saying, God, you are straight as an arrow. You are always working and taking pleasure in truth and wisdom. In verse 1, David recognized his need of mercy as a transgressor of God's law. But he takes the truth of his sinfulness to the truth revealed about God. David cries out for mercy, quote, according to God's steadfast love and according to God's abundant mercy. He doesn't simply cry out for mercy. He cries out for mercy according to God's steadfast love and God's abundant mercy. David knows the truth about his sin, but David also knows the truth about God as God has revealed himself. And these particular character traits of God, these particular truths of God are revealed to David and to us in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, where God speaks of himself. He reveals himself. He tells the truth of himself. And who, can, who is more reliable than God to speak about God? God says there in Exodus 34, 6, I am the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty? David hasn't believed his own imaginations about a God who doesn't care about sin and clears the guilty for no reason. David also doesn't believe his own imaginations about a God who is quick to get angry and eager to kick a sinner out of his love when they sin too much or too Often, David is setting an example not to imagine things about God and to approach a God of our own imaginations. David is approaching the God of Scripture, the God who has revealed himself 
as a God who doesn't clear the guilty, yet a God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. David approaches God rightly balanced in the truth about his sin and his sinfulness, but also in the truth about God's steadfast love and abundant mercy. In verse 2, David asks God to cleanse him and wash him thoroughly. David hasn't imagined some scenario where God would wash filthy sinners. No, David is looking to various places in the Mosaic Law, places like Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, where God gives clear steps for how the unclean can be made clean through ceremonial washings and purification. David doesn't ask God to do anything that God hasn't already invited him to do. Do you understand that when David is going to God and asking him to have mercy on him, he's pleading to the true God who has revealed himself as a merciful God. Do you realize that as David is going to God and asking him to cleanse him, cleanse him of his sin, of his dirtiness, He's asking a God to cleanse him who has already made ways for sinners to be cleansed, for those who are dirty to be made clean. David is setting for us a clear picture of who God is as a God abundant in mercy and steadfast love, as a God who cleanses the filthy. Now, as we turn to think about how these things might apply to us, brothers and sisters, it is always vital that our understanding and our thoughts about God be rooted and grounded in the truth that God has revealed about himself in Scripture. What you think about God is the most important thing about you. And whether or not your thoughts are true depend upon whether or not you are paying attention to how God has revealed himself to Scripture. You may not realize this, but it is so easy to simply drift into our own imaginations about who God is, or to drift into what our family says about God, or what our culture says about God. It is so incredibly easy. Not only that, but every human being is afflicted by the evil one who loves to come and tell lies about who God really is. It is so incredibly important that, like David, you and I would think about God according to God's word and how God has revealed himself. Have you come to see the truth that God's love is more steadfast than your stumbling? Have you come to see that God's love is more steadfast than anybody else's stumbling in sin? You might believe that God is more steadfast than your sin. But do you believe that God is more steadfast than your child's sin or your spouse's sin or your crazy coworker, your crazy uncle's sin? Do you believe that God's sin is greater than their stumbling? Do you believe that God's grace, his mercy is greater than your sin? Have you come to believe the truth of what God says about his abundant mercy? Or do you see him as some sort of miserly mercy pinching Scrooge. God has revealed himself as one who is abundant, abundant in steadfast love. There is an overabundance of God's steadfast love and faithfulness. God has revealed himself as one who is merciful and gracious, one who is slow to anger. This is who God has revealed himself to be. Now, as we come to make the shift from how David approached God on the basis of how God revealed himself in the Mosaic Covenant, you and I need to approach God as he has revealed himself more accurately in the New Covenant, in the covenant with Christ. The book of Hebrews regularly reminds us that the priestly duties of washing and making purification for sinners have all been pointing to and fulfilled in Jesus Christ our last and great high priest. Those ceremonies were preparing and pointing us to the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. 
Titus 3, 13 and 14. We do not go to any priest, nor do we look to any ceremony. Instead, we believe the words of 1 John 1, 6, which says, the blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. We don't look to our own good deeds. We don't look to how sorry we are. We look to the cross and by faith trust that God has made a way for sinners like you and me to be purified. And as 1 John 1 goes on to say, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As the ministry of the high priest in David's day was a clear pointer to David to go to God with his sin, so you and I have a great high priest in Christ who has, offers purification for our sins so that we might be brought back to God, even though we are sinners. In Psalm 51, God has given sinners a, son for, a song for coming back to him. I hope and pray that you will sing and live this song with a deeper knowledge of the truth about you and your sin, but also with a deeper knowledge and a deeper joy in the God of mercy who has given us Jesus, who is far greater than our sin. We have a great high priest in Christ, and he is merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are good, and we thank you for your word. We thank you that you give songs for sinners to sing for coming back to you. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who recognize the truth, not only the, the horrible truth of our sin and our sinfulness, but the glorious and joy-producing truth that you are a God of mercy and abounding and steadfast love. Thank you, Father. Bless your word in our lives. In Christ's name, amen.